Fuck you, what you're saying to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like what you get.
There. says that I'm not very patient. I can't believe that. You know, we've been married forever, so that's good. Good afternoon or evening as it is now. I'll teach you how to use a microphone. You just don't hold it up too close and it works. I'm Mary Gow and I'm the Dean of the Mike Control College of Business and the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation sits in the college. Uh, but it's a university-wide program and for those of you who don't know, we have fairly new space up on um, Chesity in what used to be the old flower shop. And we're so excited to have that as our launch pad now because we're getting more students from across campus coming in. I think folks step in sometimes from the, from the local community as well to find out what we're doing. We're going to continue building out that program through. It's doing a, a terrific job with outreach. Really excited that we can actually be in person for the pitch competition tonight. Uh, really eager to see what these great ideas are that uh, these students have come up with. So without further ado, I'll turn the back over to Dr. Bowman. Dr. Gow. I asked uh, Raphaela to uh, come and tell you some of her experiences with uh, pitching. Why, why we think pitching and doing pitching practice. I don't know what I have this coming. But anyway, uh, uh, why we why we do pitching? Why we think it's so important? Why we celebrate this uh, and that sort of stuff? Because she has been uh, across the U.S. Uh, in pitches, and so she's been representing UAG in many of those different things. Hi everyone. Oh, sorry, was that for that? Hi everyone, I'm Rafaela Villanueva. I'm currently a senior here at UNG. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Rafaela Villanueva. I'm currently a senior here at UNG. I have a major in finance and I have a minor in information systems as well. I'm currently the team captain of the UNG Women's Tennis Team and a Mycultural College of Business Student Ambassador. I've also been able to compete in several university business pitch competitions where I presented UNG as I pitched my FinTech application DirectX. DirectX is a geo-social networking application that allows users to directly exchange currencies and eliminate excessive commission costs brought about by banks, money exchange kiosks, and credit cards. Last year, I competed in the Thai University pitch competition where I actually made it to the final and topic in the final. It was very exciting because it was the first time a team from UNG had made it that far in the competition. So I'm very grateful to have been able to represent UNG in that fashion. Last year, I also uh, was actually pitching here. Uh, I was also pitching direct X and I won the crowd favorite. So over the last year, it's really been such a enriching experience for me as I was able to not only vet my, my not only vet my application, but also get a lot of great feedback and a lot of challenging questions as well, which have allowed me to develop the business model that I have today. I remember that semester my LinkedIn was getting very colorful, so it was always exciting for me. In hindsight, competing in these competitions really give you the best experience in developing a business model and presenting your ideas to other people. I remember I always had this idea of DirectX ever since I was 16 and traveling a lot abroad as an international tennis player. 
but it wasn't until 2020 when I was able to develop the initial model of my application. And it wasn't until 2021 when I was able to pitch my application in these competitions. I have I have a lot of great experience and a lot of great memories during these competitions. And these experiences serve as the starting point in continuous learning in one's journey as an entrepreneur. I remember that prior to these competitions, I was very shy in talking about my ideas and let alone talking in front of uh, large crowds. But I do have the Center of Entrepreneurship and Innovation, Dr. Bowling, and my business mentor, Bill Mayberry, for shaping me into the aspiring entrepreneur that I am today. And for those of you who are pitching your ideas for the first time, I'm very excited for the journey you're about to take as I've been enjoying every bit of mine. Good luck, and I wish you all the best. Yeah, the final she went to, by the way, was just a national uh, competition, not a local competition. Uh, just to make it a little, a little more interesting uh, from that standpoint. And uh, we were able to watch her online and, and see her pitch as she went through. So it was, uh, it was really, really interesting. Uh, but we really, we really do uh, these kind of things to help you develop kind of your presenting uh, of yourself, but not only that, but just getting comfortable uh, talking uh, with others and being able to do that so that when you graduate, you'll go out uh, and you'll feel comfortable in a business pitching a new idea there or pitching, uh, pitching something outside of that. Uh, and so that's that's why we do it. That's why I get excited about it. Uh, I, I love to see uh, the young folks when they first come in and they're kind of, you know, not sure and all that kind of stuff. And then by the time they come through two or three kitchens, they, they're all of a sudden they're just blossoming and they're just uh, uh, doing all kinds of things. Uh, so. But let's get back to this one. Uh, tonight, the same kind of thing. We have six uh, contestants that are coming in. And we have three wonderful judges uh, that are going to help us uh, evaluate your business ideas and come back and choose a winner, a uh, second place, and uh, then we'll uh, look at the crowd favorite uh, from that standpoint. So three different, uh, three different prizes that we have. Uh, but our our good uh, judges up here, Chris Smith, uh, has a chain of I guess you call it a chain, wouldn't you? Multiple offices. Yeah, multiple offices, uh, counting offices across the state and beyond. Uh, I remember uh, first time I met him, we got together and got to talking, and he uh, he talked a lot about entrepreneurship. And I I I had run into an accountant that had been like readily. Uh, talking about entrepreneurship, they just went about their business, right? Uh, but uh, so it was uh, interesting to me, and we certainly appreciate him doing that. Now he owns a chain of those whole, whole, whole uh, companies, right? Yeah, we have uh, three offices, CPA firm, and uh, offices in Alpharetta, uh, Bacon, and Lipa Computer. So any of you that are accountants, he's a good, good one to know, or if you want to get into business, he's a good one to know as well. Uh, so see him in the break and let him know. Uh, certainly appreciate that. Next we got Rod Shabu. He's a uh, he's pretty uh, pretty well known around here. Uh, been here. Uh, grad he's a graduate from uh, the University of North Georgia. Uh, now he's moved away and all the way over into camp. So I don't get to see him quite as much as I used to. But he's doing great things over there, helping them. Uh, start up a business incubator and is doing some things along those lines. But he's constantly uh, uh, asking, well, how are we doing? How are we doing here? Always wanting to help us out. In these cases, coming as a judge, uh, being able to uh, to help us, to mentor us, and to be able to uh, to grow our to grow our business. So he is a uh, he's a, a, a great uh, addition uh, to that. So, we get to our last uh, one that is a uh, uh, pretty innovative guy, right? Would you say so? Yep. 
And uh, he is, uh, are, are you still the head innovation person yes. for the Federal Reserve, right? Yes. Uh, just a small little job associated with uh, but uh, But uh, anyway, he's, he's been around and, and done all that, so we certainly appreciate uh, uh, him being here tonight and uh, helping us out in this, uh, uh, in this endeavor. And so, uh, thank you. Uh, all right, so next thing is to get the candidates up here and to get them going. Um, so with that, we'll begin with number one. about the last time you were on the water, whether it was in a boat, uh, inner tube, canoe, kayak, boogie board, and I want you to think the type of water here. Was it calm? Was it bumpy? Was the wind like moving? Uh, was a storm coming in? These are all variables you cannot control, but you can build a better boat to combat these, uh, whether in good seas or bad seas. I'm JT Lockwood, and this is Hyatt's Caverns. So, the current problems we are battling in the boat industry starts with nature. You wake up in the morning, you read the newspaper, the sea report says you got one to two foot waves. You're charging out of the inlet after you just filled up the boat with ice, bait, and uh, sodas. And uh, you're out and about, and those waves start picking up to three to fives. And it gets a little tough out there. Uh, knees start hurting, back starts hurting, neck starts hurting, and you come in early. So, kind of waste a day. Moving on to safety. So, you always have a lot of what ifs going on in your mind about, oh, what if something catastrophic happens, I hit something submerged, uh, worry about sinking, engine stops running. In the boat industry, the cost keeps going up on the daily. So uh, you pay a lot of money to start up with, uh, especially in the catamaran world. So you start at a quarter million dollars, and you have boats that are currently over $1 million. And the end user then becomes responsible for all the maintenance. Some of these boats have three, four engines, so three to four times maintenance. So it is just a, a, a rich man's game. And then the oldest boat to time is a mono hole, just the standard feed hole when you think of a boat. So those plow water instead of cutting through water, so there's a lot of resistance on the boat. All right, so the solution is to implement a catamaran style hole, which has two holes instead of one. So you use the center console where you get the great fish ability where you can move 360 degrees around the center console, console where you will be driving. And then you get the speed, efficiency, and stability, a fuel efficiency and stability of a catamaran. So think like a set of skis, these slice through the water rather than push. And that's where you get your speed and fuel efficiency from. It's a much stable platform because you get rid of that pivot point if you think of that piece shape. Think about how a bee will fall on itself compared to a flat surface. So this is like fishing on a flat surface. So you could have four people on one side of the boat fishing where all the action is. What makes this different? We'll be the first unsinkable catamaran to hit the market. Not like the Titanic, we'll actually be unsinkable. So what causes boats, boats to sink is that air space between the deck and the bottom of the hole. So you hit a wave really hard, nose goes in, Wave comes over the bow, boat starts filling up with water. As soon as that water gets below the deck, into the hole, it starts weighing the boat down, pulling it in deeper, while the waves keep coming over because the boat's deeper, it can't push them off, and then your boat's headed towards the bottom of the ocean. The way we'll fix this is you fill the boat with a closed cell foam that repels the water so the water cannot penetrate it. Think of a cooler. You have an outside shell, insulation, then an inside shell. And if you think of a cooler, it's as buoyant as it can hold. So it's the same principle. You can swap the boat. You might have six inches to a foot of water on your deck, but it's all going to move out through the rear, and you'll still be a, still be standing. Convenient size. Bigger is not always better. So 
We're going to launch a 24 foot boat because not anybody, not everybody needs a 30 or 40 foot boat, and that's our current competitors in the in the industry. So, a 24 foot boat has its benefits being okay. I have a detached garage on the side of my house. I don't need to fit a massive boat in there. Or maybe you're storing it at a marina. It's cheaper because they charge by the foot, and then trailering it. So say you want to take your boat from South Florida up to here in Georgia, and you get the great riding of the catamaran here on Lake Lanier. And then being factory direct, it'll roll right off the assembly line into the customer's hands. So this allows the customer to have a choice of their options, such as color, fit, and finish, uh, choice of their upholstery, electronics. I like my console laid out this way. GPS here, gauge here, my controls here. So the customer receives what they want. So my customer is starting with middle class America. In 2019, 62% of boat owners fell into the middle class, and that is my customer segment. A fisherman that just wants a little more out of their boat, their boat. They're spending a lot of time every weekend out on the water with their friends fishing, and they want something different. I'm here to provide that. And someone who just wants a catamaran, uh, different experience on the water, better riding. So they can, uh, it's their first boat or their 10th boat, uh, we'll provide that for them. So, looking at startup costs, it's going to be about a quarter, about a quarter million dollars for property, plant, and equipment. Looking at a building, a gantry system, crane, uh, forklifts, uh, building the molds, molds for the boat where you cast the, it's like a molding, then you pop it out. Think of like an ice cube trick. So, that stuff's all expensive. Uh, that's why it's a big cost up front. Crunching the numbers, I can build one of these boats for $80,000. And in year one of business, I hope to sell. 12 boats. So one boat a month, 30 days to get one done out the door, all hands on deck. By year two, hoping to increase 50% to 18 units in one year. And then by year three, 200% and 24 units. Meet the team, starting from left to right. That's myself. I'll be the CEO. I'm a business management major here with a concentration in entrepreneurship. To my right, that would be my brother, Michael. He's a UNG 18 graduate with accounting, uh, an accounting degree. He'll be our CFO. Uh, to the right of him is my brother Clifford, UNG 16. He will be our uh, vice president. He has a biology degree. And then our father will be the president. This is the team I trust to develop and put our passion into reality and being an affordable solution into the cataract world. Thank you, and what are your questions? Is I'll start. So no bilge pump system. Oh, of course. guarantee. Like that's a that's industry standard. I'd say. Okay. Well, you talked about the pump, so it will be similar to like a Boston whaler where you can cut it in the piece. Similar. Do you imagine doing the same kind of marketing because they've been wildly successful? I would love to hit it with a chainsaw, cut it in half, and watch that thing flip. Okay. Same same, same principle, cabinet. How are you going to market it? Like if you take on a Parker or Bertram brand, something like that, right? So how do you get the name brand recognition with only 12 units in the first year? How do you anticipate like local fishing shows? Is it just geared toward salt? Do you want to start on fresh water? What are you looking as your market additional rollout? Yes, sir, exactly. So local being the Miami International Boat Show and Fort Lauderdale Boat Show, that's where I'm from. So that is, I, I know that, that place. So it'd be great to one day get a spot in there, uh, start the sea trial program with that. As soon as we get the boat in the water, uh, start taking customers out and start taking pre-orders. Okay, because in boating, I'm, a, I'm an ex-commercial fisherman. Was that Sabrina or Lighthouse, by the way? Uh, alligator Reef. Okay. And Adam Rodden, All right. Uh, with with fishing and things like that, the marketing is probably a higher cost than you're anticipating. So I would maybe go back and look at your business case because to get the orders in, right? Somebody's going to want to actually see it in a demo, etc. So. But no, I applaud you because I agree that the, the cat is much stabler than the single people. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are any of these designs are subject to USCG approval? So every every boat that is made, uh, whether it's a homemade or uh, just wide scale, you do have to get approved through the United States Coast Guard. So that is some hoops you'd have to jump through because um, I know with fuel it comes with a hazmat certification and stuff like that. So the US, US Coast Guard would have to approve the, uh, the boat being built after it's yeah, through inspection, making sure you're not using like home improvement wiring instead of uh, marine grade wiring, uh, so you reduce that chance for fire, any complications on the line. Uh, yeah, he answered my question on certification. Uh, timing, I'm thinking about timing on this. Where are you looking at your sources of funding to uh, 
uh, month startup costs yes, sir. and uh, and what kind of timing do you think you will be required in terms of certification, design work, molds to be built, all that, and really get your market. Yes, sir. So right now, um, both my brothers are active to the army. So and I'll be commissioning in May. So uh, it's it's just a stepping stone for us currently. So we're hoping maybe after we're all done with our time and service, we'll be able to take that over. And what's the first time you're uh, this, where, where's, where's your source of funding? Oh, private investor. Yes, sir. Private investor. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, family. Yes, sir. Right. Have you thought about partnering with like a fishing competition or anything like that? Or you can have a way to the trail or the boat around to those kinds of shows? You don't have the cost like you do in a Miami boat show. I mean, that is pretty expensive to get into that with a, a single model. Yes, sir. That's a great idea, along with there's a lot of Instagram pages out there now that will come showcase your boat. They'll get on your boat, they'll shoot basically a promotion for it. Uh, especially if you partner with a company like that that is running in a social media page, maybe you can let them throw their livery on the side of the boat. Um, that is another great way to get the boat's name out there. Gentlemen, thank you. Any, any dog got a question? Yes, ma'am. Do you know where you want to have your manufacturing facility? So, sorry, you thought that out as far as what the cost is set up where you would, your space you would need? Yes, ma'am. So, currently, uh, I live in South Florida, and it's hard to find a big enough lot or warehouse space to purchase. So, actually, we have the steel building being built about 15 minutes from here, a uh, 40 by 70 steel structure. Um, so, that is that is the first step in getting this done. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay, we had a good first start. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah good. JT did great. Next up, we have uh, Lyson. I hear she is. I manage the books, I manage the website, 
and I make ship and package all of our orders. So our growth and implementation plan. Currently, we sell in Hamilton's meat market as well as on our website. So as far as expansion goes, we plan to increase the variety of our treats. That would include the flavors, shapes, and sizes. We plan to move into more than just dog treats. So other products that would help benefit your pet's health. We're getting ready to launch a healthy, it's a paw bomb for your pet. Would go to heal your pet's cracked and dry paws. So we also plan to target larger areas, larger areas, so not just Northeast Georgia. Our projected financial growth. So as you can see up here, our startup cost was $150 this year. I'm so happy to announce that we just reached our $150 mark in sales. So our projected sales for the year are $1,650. Our expenses are going to range about $500, but our projected profit is $1,150. For 2023, our projected sales are $2,750. Our expenses do increase by $200, 7 to $700, and our projected profit also rises to $2,050. For 2024, you can see that our projected sales rise to $4,980 in sales, but our expenses rise to $1,000, but with big risks come big rewards. So that brings our projected profit up to $3,980. Now, let's talk a little bit about my inspiration behind Lacey Bee's Park Tree. So you can see here are my two dogs. The one on the top, that is Mr. Coops, and the bottom is Cooper. I was reading an article one day and realized what people put in these manufactured pet trees. And I realized that my pets deserve more. If you have any more questions about this, you can park read, you can find us online or ask right now. I'll start first. Uh, how many different SKUs did you have and where do you see yourself you know, in the next year or two? So, in the next year or two, I see myself uh, in stores, not just in local to Monica, but all over Georgia. That's where we hope to be. And you said how many SKUs? Yeah, how many SKUs like so? How many different products do you have? So currently on our website, we offer the two. We have the peanut butter and pumpkin and the fresh fresh biscuits that are in front of you. I'm working daily on new products to increase our variety. And um, we offer two sizes as well. We offer the one ounce sample packages that you have in front of you and a seven ounce large bag. Your sales with, with online and whatnot, do you see any concern about like postal increases? And have you considered a subscription model where somebody puts a credit card and then you just deliver that what you said? Yes. So we actually do offer that feature on the website. We do have a subscription feature. And the first part of your question postal? Yeah, the, the cost that you have, it doesn't seem <clears throat> like your, your growth could be as much as it could be. Are yes. you the only person making right now? I am. I'm specifically on my own. Do you plan to add to that? Yes, division. Um, and as far as postal increases go, yes, that is a very big concern because shipping labels are not cheap, let me tell you. So we're working on a, something to fix that. Right now I do use a subscription service to lower the cost of the shipping labels. So I like the, uh, you know, the type of product like that. I think that's something that can be pretty popular out there. Uh, I think there's potential growth out there. The things that uh, may want to think about is systems. Um, right now, just you. I see. I saw your expenses that you have there. There, I would imagine most of it is cost of the packaging, cost of the product. Yes. So, um, you know, some things that to think about there is um, what are other expenses that are going to enable you to scale this product, you really start to, to grow it, um, and really turn into something that's that you can live on. Yes, so right now one of the biggest expenses is like you said packaging. Um, the labels, every all three of the labels that you see on that bag are printed at home. Um, one of the ways that we can reduce our cost is to order in bulk our labels that we put on our packaging. 
but it is expensive, so we have not yet had the funding for that. What's your average sale right now? Um, as far as how much the trees go for? Well, like uh, how much is the average person spending? The average person on a small box is three dollars, and on a large box. So if we give a customer, are they like just buying one bag, or are they buying multiple bags? What's your average transaction? So typically it's one bag at a time, but I have had multiple repeat customers. Have you gone about partnering with some of the shelters or maybe some of the adoption get a sample? Yes, I did mean to mention that. So as far as our expansion goes, we have a donation program set up on our website. So you can go onto the website and go onto our donate page and all of the profits that are donated go to make treats to give to the local shelters. One final question. So you talk about how healthy it is and everything. Is the packaging recyclable? And if it is, maybe that's something you want to advertise as well to bring yes. it all home. Packaging is recyclable. If you look at the total cost of this, you know, in terms of do the product inside, packaging outside, is it a situation where your packaging may be more expensive than the product inside? Um, yes, but not that much. We have it all calculated out on how much we spend for each each thing, and it is, but it's not by more than that. So 50 50? Yes. That cost? Curious, how do you know like, the, the different flavors of things? How do you come up with that? A lot of trial and yeah, error. Yeah, the tester at the house. <laughs> 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 Anything else? No. Just, are there any government regulations that, that become a concern? So we're still looking into that, but from my research so far, I've not come across any. So, but I am doing vigorous research on that. So that suggestion. A tester may be good testing instead of someone like him. I do have, I do you, have certified tech testing. Yes. Yes. yes, we are working to get those out into shelters locally because I'm from Jasper, so I'm servicing Monica, Jasper, those areas right now. So we're working to get those in shelters, stores, all around. And you may be something for green at all, uh, but I would definitely also look at breweries where you're allowed to bring your dogs. There's a lot of in town and dog parks, just because you're going to have a consumer there as well who can actually make the purchase. Yes, I've talked to a lot of people on the square, which I'm excited to announce that those will probably be in the stores at the square soon, um, but with more traffic is coming soon. Yes. Anything else? Oh, you yes. thought about branding, marketing your product, why, you know, getting it out there more, like for Mel. That's natural, it's good for your dog, but I'm assuming that you can have to put yourself on the front while you're competitors. Yes, so that has been a challenge, but we are working on it. Yes. Uh, so, how does your product compare to the center already in the market? Have like large increase in chewy online dog cooker? You can order organic products just like this. So, how does it kind of match up compared to those? So, with mine, it is marketed so they're it, like. Even with those organic products, a lot of the ones that I have seen personally, there's still this huge list of ingredients, and I, mine is marketed so there's nothing to it. All of my ingredients are very clearly laid out. Last question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the shelf life ranges from four to six weeks. Um, they come in the heat sealed packaging, which is reflexible. So that helps. Let's give lessons. All right, next up we have uh,
and if it's a day, I'll be presenting my company, Cyber Solution. So one thing I've noticed in the world is that cyber threats are increasing towards everybody in this Today, we just cost people about six trillion dollars just to just to come up with the fixed attacks that are happening companies nowadays. And another thing that I've Another thing that I've noticed is that mothers are not educated on the subject. A lot of them believe that they are not, not compromisable to cyber attacks because they feel like they're too small and that they don't, and that they aren't going to be attacked since they just are small. Even the other day, I was talking to my friend. He, he saw a server room just completely wide open in this small company. He knew that he could just take the information grab the clients and pretty much just be out of there and then hold their stuff ransom for future future contacts. So this is where cyber solutions come in. We're a cyber security consulting firm and what we want to do is we want to help educate you and let you know what's going on in this world and also build a full technical setup. So this would include penetration testing, this would include things that go into building up an incident response plan and making sure that you're prepared to know that any cyber attacks are happening or that. And this also includes building it up an IT department if you don't have one. So a lot of companies don't even prepare for anything going on. They, about 50% of companies don't even have an incident response plan in place. So this would help. So we would help build up an IT department and other things just to help you be better prepared as as companies move to these online platforms. So what makes us different? What really makes us different is we give a hands-on approach. We really want we really want you guys to just we want to be there with you and we want to build up as you guys grow and get bigger. A lot of companies nowadays with COVID happening, they move to a, they've really moved to online platforms. They're doing a lot of things online. So security is a major issue coming forward. That. And a, another thing that makes us different is that we offer recurring support. So when when we come in, build up your software and hardware, and build up and educate you on everything, we still check up with you afterwards, and we make sure that you're you're doing good as your company grows. And the last thing we want to do is just be affordable. We're gonna be talking to a lot of small businesses, so we just want to make sure that we're affordable for you guys, and that we can be there for you guys. In the future. So with that being said, our target market, as you can see, are going to be small American businesses. A lot of these small American businesses don't think that they need any security, so we want to target those businesses. There are currently about 31 million small American businesses in, in the United States, and what I want to do personally is I want to start off locally. I want to go into Atlanta and try find these businesses that don't have any security in place and I want to talk to them and build up their security as we go about. And lastly, these will be our financial projections for our next few years. The first year will just be me working by myself. It would include my startup cost lines for technology and getting an office space. So that will be about uh, sale about, about $10,000 just for me to find all the right equipment and uh, place to build. And then what I want to do is get about 10 clients that first year, and that will accrue about $60,000 of profit with all the effort, penetration testing, and software that I put in place. Then the next year, as I grow and try and find another partner to be with, we'll try and get up, up about 15 companies, 15 to 20 companies, and then we'll grow up our profits up to $150,000. And then the next year, we want to get about 35 clients in the Atlanta area and grow, grow our company that way. So a little bit about me, though. I'm a UNG cybersecurity major. I'm also part of the CyberCon team. So I've seen all of this stuff firsthand. I've done code breaker challenges and others and other things that have just shown me how bad cybersecurity is in our world. So I really just, I know that it's a big problem and that it's only going to growing in the future. The market, the industry of cybersecurity is growing about like 8% each year annually. So I know this will be a good future company just to grow into and build up as we go about. Thank you guys.
market segment that you're looking to go after first? Like maybe somebody that makes payments versus somebody that just does like pumping inventory and things like that to be from the market segment. So I want to go after people that are just posting online, um, people that have a lot of clients and like have like valuable information, so they can like make a small account of or something like that. So that's that's the main part. That's that's the main all over. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about going after, do you envision yourself as a white hat hacker and uh, showing them yeah. the vulnerability? Yes, that's exactly what it's about. I want to go in there first, give them like a free flow, tell them, ask them if they even know if they're protected on anything. And then I want to pretty much go door to door and be like, hey, educate them on the subject and educate them on the So that they know what they're doing and what they're getting into. And are you aligning yourself with any insurance companies to cover any liability in case of uh, so I haven't looked into that yet, but I probably wouldn't do that anyway as soon as I start. To me, that's the big thing. And I know you're not going to come talk to us at the bench because you're shy, but yes. what we have companies doing, that's very, very important because they're going to know I'm paying you for a service, but then it's what is your guarantee? Yes. Yes. That would be one area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when you're looking at your projections, I think you're understanding your projections. Uh, it's just knowing what I pay for a location for yeah. some fine differences for cybersecurity. Uh, in some of those locations, your entire first year profit is what we pay in a quarter, right? So I'll look at that and make sure you pay yourself, right? It's you and everyone else, you know what kind of market it is right now for cybersecurity. People are pulling in multiple six figures. Yeah. Just make sure you pay yourself. Okay. Yeah, this is, I, I see your market size being quite large. Uh, the sweet spot is going to be the organizations that are meeting some security numbers. Uh, and it's a hot topic for us. We're, we're all, um, all over it ourselves, uh, just because the sense of nature of the information we, we have. Uh, it's an area that CPA firms are getting into. So not only should you be looking for a CPA firm as a client, you should also look for a CPA firm as a potential uh, collaboration target um, where you can collaborate with them. Um, because you know, those firms are sitting in a position with businesses to ensure that they're safeguarding their assets and cybersecurity falls right into that. Um, uh, and the, I think you, a um, few things to think about, you know, developing a recurring revenue stream and the services you're providing to figure out ways in which you can disconnect your time and your earnings. Um, you know, especially to get started from a consultant standpoint, the hours that you have, the hours that you have for people that are working for you, that's your inventory, and that's limited. So that, those are the suggestions I have. One other thing on the on the insurance side is, is you try to partner with some of these insurance companies in terms of uh, they offer discounts to their clients if they meet so many standards and if they go through um, you know SOC compliance training or if they you know get some audits done. Try to find those insurance companies that need help with some of the smaller clients and then you have to get yourself a clientele look from them essentially and you can't do business right away. And I was gonna add on say maybe talk to the small business administration group. And the other thing is maybe talk to some local banks that companies can get for loans, right? Because you can help them protect that asset. Okay, so think about ways you can differentiate, differentiate yourself. This is kind of what I call blocking and tapping type business. It's, it's, so it's pervasive, it's needed everywhere, and you're going to have a lot of players over the next decade that are going to come out in the marketplace. How can you differentiate yourself uh, and, uh, and, and provide a unique level of service that is just to the next year? Get the white hat reputation and that'll take them all away. Yeah, for sure. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys. Thank you. What do you think so far? Students around. And we certainly appreciate that. So next up we have Ryan Horseman. Mr. Ryan. Right. <laughs> well, 
you know how much Lumpkin County spends on juvenile incarceration every year? Let me take a guess. How much spent? $120,000. About $3.7 million a year. To Cab County? That's $65 million. Polk County? About $125 million. Not on incarceration, teen incarceration. Just juvenile. Right? That's a massive, massive problem. My name is Ryan Fosner. My group's a nonprofit called the Modern Pioneer Road Institute. We tend to fix this problem. So the problem itself mostly relates to at-risk teens. At-risk teens are teens are in a situation where they can be considered at risk where they're at a higher suicide rate, higher rate of depression, significantly higher rate of violence and crimes, and the highest rate is, of course, with incarceration. Incarceration rate is actually so bad in the U.S. It is 65% of something called recidivism, which is how often a criminal goes back to jail if they get incarcerated. That means if 10 people in this room got incarcerated, about six to seven will go back. That sounds like a broken system to me. That sounds like a broken cycle that will continue to repeat itself. My goal is to break that cycle entirely, to get them out of that cycle or to remove them from that cycle before they can even get inside of it. And of course, what this does is it cripples the workforce by having all of these teams who don't believe in themselves, don't think they can actually achieve a reliable job and make a difference in their community and their society because they're incarcerated or because they're in these awful situations that they're in that are not their fault. They just need a little guidance to get out of this bad situation. So, imprisonment, in DeKalb County, like I said, about $125, $120 million a year. Education spending, about 10 times that. And how many they incarcerate every year? About 335. How much they educate every year? A little over, under a quarter million. Costs 18 times as much to incarcerate a teen for a year than it does to educate them. That is massive. We can break this cycle by thus changing how they go into the system instead of bringing them into prison where they're realistically going to come back, chances are. Instead, we can bring them into our program, which is us. What are we? We're modern pioneer wilderness group. You might ask, what the hell is that? What does that mean? Why are you different? What we do, our goal, is to be able to give useful work skills, set these teams up for success, so they know what they're doing in the workplace and they're prepared because there are already people out there that are doing this system, but they're not prepared. It's that they're doing temporary solutions. Ours is a permanent solution to break them out of this cycle. All they do is just repeat this cycle. If we prepare them for the real world where they can sustain themselves, then they'll be more effective for the community, for the environment that they're in, and actually contribute significantly more to society. How are we going to do that? We plan on taking individuals and teens into a wilderness-based situation out in the woods for one to three months, where we start off with basic survival type skills, building a fire, building a shelter, really stuff that you might find difficult, but with a bit of guidance, it's actually very easy and very gratifying, which is our goal. We're supposed to pull them out of their current environment of drugs, sex, violence, crime, into the wilderness, where everything's a lot more simple. You need very few things in life in the wilderness. Right? And you succeed at these challenges, and they realize, oh, I can do some things. So when we shift them into our modern portion, from our wilderness setting, our remote setting, into a more virtualized setting, where we can then teach them how to build applications, go through mock interviews, apply for internships, apprenticeships, and actually set them up with that. And then we set up in the real world. And they can think, oh, this little resume? Built a fire in the woods. I can do this resume easy. This is not. The idea is to build confidence because that's what is mostly lacking in these adverse teams. They lack confidence. That is our goal to build them confidence. And with that, everything else comes. Who are our customers? Our customers are actually not the teens because other two groups have done this. We're wilderness therapy. We are not a wilderness therapy. We don't work with the teens because what they do is they're for profit companies. And on top of that, when they don't completely help the team, but help them enough to make them want to come back, they make more money. That's their goal, to make more money. We're nonprofit. 
We don't want to make money. And any money we do, we flush back into the system to help more people. That's our goal. So we don't work for those people. We work for things like Outward Bound Equinox. Have you heard of those? They're at risk team groups. They have an absolutely outstanding goal, a great goal, but not a great method of actually helping teams. These at risk wilderness, wilderness health groups, they have a pretty good method of doing it, but not a very good goal because they just want to make money. We're trying to take the combination of these two and put it together with a good goal and a good method of achieving that actual goal. So we'll work directly under these groups like Outward Bound Equinox, right? these at risk team groups, so they'll be monitoring us, which is what makes us very different from those current groups. We have somebody oddling us at all points. There are groups out there, like these at risk, excuse me, these, uh, these wilderness therapy groups that have lawsuits, big lawsuits, because they're abusing the children that are there. Because they don't have anyone looking over them, observing what they're doing. They just have free reign, and then they're getting paid to do it. Our goal is to be audited by these adverse team groups that have been known to be successful but need a little help. We work similar to a subcontractor for them. And they would guide us through this. They would mentor us as we mentor the teams and help them significantly. How much did it cost? Sound like it's cost a lot. Right? We're going to need, give or take, 300 acres of land to start off. Enough room to spread out and have a large enough forest wilderness, 12 and a half feet of covered facilities. This is going to cost about a half a million dollars. Most of this is going to be the cost of land and the extra start facilities. Our yearly expense is going to be a little over a million dollars. This is mostly due to the staff that we'll have to have on deck. We have to have counselors, we have to have teachers that are teaching these people, as well as mentors. Right? And then, of course, we've got back housing, finance, and things and such. So it's quite costly. Who's going to do me the, the cost of this each team going through in our help session between one to three months, give or take? It's going to be about $1,200 to about $3,200. Not that much money when you consider how much of an impact they're costing, right? Which is what we are trying to fix, right? Our value in this, our profit, is not a monetary profit, profit, is a happier, healthier team that is productive in their work environment and prepared for the workforce. But government is a really nice problem as well. Not a problem. And avoided cost. Right? Since we're paying these massive amounts of goals to reduce the incarceration by 15% in our account and in our, our board and counties over the course of 10 years. Cost us about 10 years to it costs about about $10 million to operate for 10 years. In the affected counties that we're starting in, that'll save over $30 million. Cost in 10, save in 30. Which thus makes us an incentive for the state to give us a grant. Things as such. So, thank you very much. My name is Ryan Foster. I'm the modified and What are your questions? So, first question is Do you envision this being the judge makes them go to this, or how do you get that enrollment? How do you get a city kid right, to commit, or the parents to commit to sending them to something like this? That's a good question. So right now, the uh, the judges are already putting them into groups like those at-risk team groups that I said earlier, except they're starting to overflow and they need more help in branches and ways to help these teams. Okay. And my follow-up is, when the camp is over, you talk about how they most the six or seven out of ten end up back in it. How do you ensure that those teams, when they go back in that environment that you took them out of, don't end up back. Like that should differentiate to me, right? If we can prove that, then you can be wildly successful with this. Our goal is to do that with um, specifically internships and apprenticeships. We will put them into trade school situations, put them into colleges, things of the such, <coughs> as well as hopefully to have scholarships, but that would be a long term, long distance thing. Um, it's quite expensive just to uh, host scholarships. We hope to get them into uh, cheaper trade schools as well as actually getting them into the workforce. With uh, and my final question is, the people that are going to help you with this camp, how do you make sure that they're certified? Because the records and the information you get, like if a child or a teen is suicidal, you know what I mean? Like you'll get medical records, you might want to team up with cyber solutions. Um, for example, <laughs> and then like, again, how do you make sure that you're prepared, right? Because what you want to do and what you want to provide the service is great. It's all the ancillary things to make it happen. I don't know that you fully have accounted for that in your future projects. I understand. Yes, I'll look forward to that. I think it's a project. Thank you.
what are the types of training that these individuals are going to have to be able to deal with this? Are there certain boards that they get certified by? Or are you referring to the staff that I'm going to now deploy? Um, yeah, most of it will be uh, suicide prevention, try to protect training, as well as depression recognition, um, as well as a, uh, a course in, in um, uh, violence recognition and um, being able to sort of or a bias referral to be able to um, stop whatever violence that may happen. And in what range of you are you looking at to bring into this program? Are we talking about? Yes, you know, misdemeanors or you know where what's the upper limit? Um, are you talking about an age range? You're talking about a in, in terms of crime committed. Oh, crime committed. Well, since most of the time it's going to be allotted by judge, that's not necessarily our choice. If we aren't taking employment from individuals, that's what makes us different from those other groups that are doing it and have massive lawsuits. So it'll be up to the judge, and then it'll cycle through those actual adverse team groups, which will go down to us. One suggestion that I have, if you can work with the legal system and as teams complete this, their records are erased, that may be a really good selling point for you as well, because that's the key thing from getting these kids jobs. They come out and they have a record. If there was some way that you could help, you know, I don't want to say expunge, but maybe that's the word, right? Um, and also, how do you separate the classifications? If someone's depressed versus someone that's violent, Put them all together. To We're probably going to have three different groups okay. of, of um, some sort of violent group. We're, we're probably going to separate males and females because of uh, violence or sexual based crimes, um, as well as drug abuse and, and things of the such. We can go through with rehabilitation stages. And you may want to make that part of your rollout. Like you start with less offensive crimes until you're sure that you're actually ready to maybe handle some of those hard ones as well. If you want early success, right? You want to be able to lean back on that. That's what you want to be able to promote for something like this. And I, I thank you very much. I agree with um, promoting to the judicial system to use us because we will be saving a very significant amount of money on their incarceration system. So that'd be a really good incentive for them. Thank you. So uh, who do you see as, um, I guess it's a strange in, in this environment, but who do you see as um, collaborate, collaborators and competition. One of the first things that came to mind to me when we were thinking about this is those about scout and uh, boys and girls clubs. And so, how do you see yourself fitting into those other organizations that are doing some of the same things you're doing? And I, I applaud you for doing this because what you're talking about here is, is really the underbelly of society, and it, it's hard sometimes for organizations like this to raise money. It's, it's it's easy when you see a pretty puppy in the humane society, great money for the puppies in the humane society, but this is this is where you've got, you've got trouble teams and, and you've got trouble families as well. But how do you see yourself plugging in and collaborating with other groups uh, that are doing similar work? Well, um, we'll be nice to plug in with those adverse team groups specifically, and um, our competitors would be the wilderness um, therapy group that are already out there. So they run through a different system to an extent. Um, still people who could go from individual to outbound to us, but nobody will go to the individual to us. Is there an age of intervention that you're looking at? Um, our main focus would probably be around uh, teens that are between 16 to 19. We think that's one of the most uh, important ages for somebody finding themselves and what they want to do with their life. So we think that would be the most influential. Okay, and um, uh, internal governance, is there a plan for the board of directors with this? Nonprofit, and have you thought through that? Who would be participating in that internal governance that, that kind of keeps the organization in check? Yes, so we're thinking about having um, a like a council for sense, and most of that being represented by our overhead uh, companies or those at risk team groups that we represent. So they, we would be mostly, excuse me, they would represent a very significant portion of our company because they will be on us and looking over us and making sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, the other thing I saw that you had a pretty significant amount of money for schooling and that's, that was going to require a lot of fundraising to get to that. As I also saw you had some yearly expenses about $1.1 million uh, in there. And I, I'm not sure exactly what you have all, you know, how you came to that number. But one thing to consider, there is a lot of land out, timber land out there and conservation easements where land is, is, is being pushed to the side for conservation purposes. 
there could be a land lease, there could be some, 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 some sort of a donation that's out there that would bring that, that curve we have there way down. Uh, and that's something that, that you should probably consider there. But what did, what, what did you contemplate in some of those yearly expenses that you have? Um, for the yearly expenses, it's mostly going to be the, the payment of staff, because I know we're going to have a professional staff on board that's going to have to be well trained and will have to go through yearly training. So we know since we're going to start with a staff of give or take 10 individuals, including myself, and we're paying an average of about $72,000. Um, that's going to look up your well majority of your uh, three quarters of that cost. And I think uh, with, with additional training, it would cost a little extra, uh, maybe $50,000 worth of extra training that each will have to go through over every year. Is there a ratio you're looking at from, you know, a, a counselor per se uh, versus the number of participants? Um, yes, so our goal would be that um, really no counselor would want to have more than, and since the kids are cycling out between one every three months, one month, three months, um, our goal would be no counselor would have more than 10 people, considering that would at, at any point our goal ideal would be about six people that would focus folks a little bit more one on one for that one to three months. So that way they're not overwhelmed. One final comment. Um, talk to companies and organizations like unions that offer apprenticeships for plumbers, electricians, things like that. So when these kids rotate through, they come out, you have that connection, they can go into one of those one to three year programs. That's very much our plan. Get them head hooked up with a job afterwards to make sure we are successful. And the Technical Colleges of Georgia has a Be Pro, Be Proud Georgia bus tour going on right now where you're able to. Um, get students and, and, and youth involved with a lot of these trades that are that are understaffed. Um, and there are a lot of scholarships and uh, Georgia tuition waivers for some of these high and deep trades that are out there. So I'm looking for that as well. I'm very much looking for that. Thank you. I'll help with those questions and trade schools and do some questions. Audience, do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>
not that comfortable. And then you're going to have the new sons of the work with this instructor for 30 minutes. And you're just going to throw baseball down. Let them swing, and then you're done. And you're done back. Oh, by the way, that 30 minute lesson costs anywhere between 45 and 85 plus dollars for 30 minutes. But you remember something. When you Googled baseball training lessons, you also saw an app. On the name, OP, online performance, that says I can do not just that, but better at home. So the yeah, app, you grab your phone, you register for the app, you uh, sign up for the subscription model, and you record your child's swing and submit it. Well, that's going to take a little bit of time for a professional instructor to work with it, to go through and analyze it. Well, while that's happening, go through the instructional videos that are laid out from start to finish, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and go from there. All from the comfort of your own home. Then when the instructor gets back, you just can lay out exactly what you need to, where you should focus through module videos, going from beginning from the ground up all the way through. Now you're a coach that coaches you on the field, he can sign up for the app, get a coaching dashboard, all of his players on it. That way, you can see exactly what each player needs to focus on, what the instructor's recommending, reinforce that at practices, and go through it from there. So that way, everyone is on the same page, including the parents, on what they need to work on. The instructional videos are bite-sized pieces for the players, long, more in-depth pieces for the parents, coaches, <coughs> and everyone else involved. That way, they can reinforce exactly what's going on. And lastly, the coaching dashboard, their practice plans. If they want to reinforce what they do at practice with what they, what's being worked on with the players, they can. But they build on one each other, on each other. Now there are currently 60 million athletes in the United States, 24 of which play baseball and softball, which will be our primary sports to start with, as well as golf. If we can just get 0.01% of that market share within the next five years. That is 2.4 thousand subscriptions. Now I want you to meet my little friend, Daniel. He's gone through this program. Starting from your left, that was prior to when he started getting video analysis. As you can see, his front leg is not locked out. It's bent. It doesn't quite look like the game, which you can see in a normal high school, college, professional swing. This back does not get through. The middle one was after nine months of working through video analyzation, going through videos. If you were to compare that to a professional level swing, you would see a lot of similarities. Now, say it's perfect, but you would see a lot of similarities. Front legs locked down, back foot's getting through, and he's working with long. Now, the last picture, I want you to pay attention to his face. Look how happy he is. That was after his first <coughs> home run, mere weeks after the middle picture was taken. So, we're going to take kids' ability, we're going to enhance it for long-term enjoyment. Now for the management team, it's just me. That's it. The, in the sports industry, now everyone here knows me as Ryan Broussard. In the sports industry, though, I'm known as Coach Broussard. Because of my knowledge, my connections, and the success we've had helping players across the whole right now, Georgia, Coach Broussard, we plan on outsourcing the rest of the video analyzation that we cannot handle in-house to other coaches in high school and college. We currently have eight willing to join us right now. Now, for financials, we have an initial startup cost of $160,000. $150,000 of that is for a medium app development. The next $10,000 on the initial is going to be for the equipment required to do in-house video recording for the instructional videos. Now for yearly operating costs. The $22,500 is going to be for the 15% maintenance on the app. There's an asterisk though, asterisk book. We have a couple of variable costs. Marketing and sales is going to consist of 5% of grossing. The Research and development portion is going to also consist of 5%. And here's our biggest expense. Trained instructors. Instructors that analyze the video footage, 
because we're going to want to spend 10 to 50 percent of what comes in. Now we have our membership projections down below, and as you can see, we're going to work and continue to grow consistently. But that's a weird trend on that chart. Why all of a sudden in year five are we dropping? That's because of machine learning. We plan on utilizing and growing a machine learning database that can go through, analyze the footage right then and there, provide instant feedback, and reduce on our number one cost, which will be the instructors that analyze the footage. And so what's next? We have machine learning. That's going to be the number one focus. We're going to expand past baseball, softball, <coughs> and golf, and then continue to upgrade and utilize our Thank you very much, everyone. So uh, I was surprised to see the uh, short cost dollars The first thing I thought about is this is just a, there's not a lot of capital involved. Yes, sir. Equipment. What's going into your startup cost? What, what are you contemplating when you think about some of this cost? So definitely the biggest part of it will be the medium app development. To handle a database that size and have the coaching dashboard work with that. So that's definitely the biggest chunk. Um, because to have a functioning app at that size really costs, you get what you pay for in that aspect. Uh, absolutely. So instead of cutting corners, that initial capital, that investment. Software development. Software development, yes, sir. That's, okay. that's the number one. And the other question I had is you, you mentioned you bring other coaches in. Sir, yes, sir. So what, what are you anticipating that to be your uh, compensation plan for those other coaches? Uh, what kind of cash is going to be required for that? What are you about compensating in other ways? Other people? So that would be uh, based off of the videos they analyze. It'll be a per video basis. We subscription model sets up for where tier one, you'll get one. Uh, one uh, analyzation a month, two, two, and three, four. So it is priced into the actual subscription model where when it, a video is analyzed, that coach is making a set amount for a video analyzed to encourage them to however much you want to work, they can work and go through that. So it's going to be a cash based essentially model where the paid based off of what they do. So you almost answered my other question. That was how you're pricing out your subscription model. So so is there a base uh, for using the, the app, or is it just a per analysis? So there is a, so we plan to offer free instructional videos that you can view with advertisements. And for the initial base, uh, it's going to have, there's a cost to have your instructional, your videos analyzed. That's where the cost comes in, and you have to do the more in-depth database, if that makes sense, of videos. Uh, and then just tears up based on how many times you want to work with an instructor, essentially, a uh, month. All right, and then my final, sorry, my final question is, um, what's your plan for market penetration? Market penetration. So right now, uh, I'm very fortunate. I have made a lot of connections with being in the sports industry with many high schools. I've worked with many high schools, uh, even the Texas A&M development coordinator. So that's a small start. But the number one thing will be to start at local rec leagues and travel tournament organizations if we're talking baseball and softball. Meet on the ground, start talking about it with coaches, incorporate everyone in that because that's going to be the number one and most cost effective way. Uh, number two, I'm a digital marketing uh, maker, so basic marketing, Facebook marketing to the parents, to the mothers. Uh, Showing what we do will be another big aspect of that. So, by boots on the ground and creating that local before we go national will be the uh, number one way we get marketing and then growing. So, I actually just did a review of some of these uh, for our rugby team. So, what makes you different from Huddle and Coach Logic and, and Sports Guide and some of the other vendors out there that kind of offer the, the same product? Really, the quality of the coaching set we have. Um, and the, the number one thing, let me change it. The number one thing is incorporating the coach itself on, themselves on everything that they're playing. So the coach can join in, they'll have all their players on the, uh, within their team. They can see what each of them need to focus on. That's give them an idea on what to focus on. At practice, what they need to look for. And then they can even have communication with the 
uh, with the instruction itself. So we want to really involve the player, the parent, and the coach as well. And honestly, the ability to for the parent at home to watch a longer segmented video on what the player is working on, involving the parent in that instruction will go a long way toward maintaining consistency and growth rather than just relying on a kid watching one minute and 30 second video. Awesome. And then uh, you mentioned that you were going to spend about $10,000 on video equipment. Is this for the actual participants? That would be for, that's for our in house. Uh, Yes, from instructional videos. That's going to be done with us. We may have uh, college coaches coming in and run stuff, but that's just for us to set up the uh, um, instructional video tapes. And, and one last thing is uh, as you look at different ways of compensation, and as you kind of grow this and incorporate AI, which I'm looking at AWS, they're doing a lot of sports right now. Thank you very much. Um, you can probably try to work out some kind of deal where if these coaches, especially at the collegiate level are doing some of these transactions for you where they can get free scouting reports yeah. right depending on what level they are so they can build up their credit with these scouting reports <clears throat> if they're doing this work for you so just an idea no thank you very much it's a fantastic idea i want to find thank you very much so i have two suggestions i coach a high school across the western yes state. yes sir and we use huddle as well think about putting together a highlight Okay. Because yes, that's a big seller when kids go up and they start thinking about college. One of the first things the coaches will ask for would be a highlight. Yes, yes, sir. Second thing is when I was at Athlete Running Innovation, we partnered with some sports psychologists because the parents spend so much money on the kids, and a lot of times it's not the swing, it's more of a mental aspect. Absolutely. So think about incorporating that into the app as well. Yes, sir. That'll, that'll be that next, that door, that next level for them to keep them going. You're understand correct because it's, especially once they finish some point, Parents will be just so hard. You've got to be able to mentally, especially in a failure driven, I mean, you're mentally failed sports. Yep. And say, yep. very much pitching. Exactly, yep. correct. So maybe that, that's a very good suggestion. Thank you so much. Anyone else have any questions? So, what incentives are there to ensure that unmotivated young athletes and their families are actually going back to youth program? Like, so the we're going to go back to that coaching dashboard. Think about the social media aspect to it, based off of improvement. So everyone's going to be uploading footage and stuff, and then they're going to get feedback on it. Players can support each other on that team coaches dashboard and help each other grow. Because at the end of the day, especially based on softball, you're battling the other team. And when you're hitting or something, it's you against the whole other team. So have your teammates build you up and create that social environment. And also the coaches, even the Keeping them coming back because they need to put practices to improve. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, next up, Jordan Cook. With the drink index. staying this long. I know I'm the last presenter, so thank you very much. Um, tonight, I'm going to be presenting to you on my personal product, the Drink Index. This has become the solution for a problem that's plagued me for more than a year now. So, I'll ask you, have you ever struggled pulling together all the materials? Have you ever struggled pulling together all the materials for hosting a party or bringing together a meal for your family? Think Thanksgiving, think a charcuterie wine night you're hosting, That'll be a later example. But 
as it says, I am forgiving. I went to a few army schools last summer and had an awesome opportunity to succeed. I came back and completely forgot about all the different things I liked. Coming home, I wanted to celebrate with my closest friends and family, so I went to the Publix, I got my ribs, I got the rest of the barbecue materials that I need, and of course, I got the most important thing out of everything, which was the beer. So, I come home, putting everything, that, excuse me, I'm standing in the frozen or the beer aisle at Publix, and I'm looking over all the brands, feeling overwhelmed, much like I am right now. And I remember the brand names, Creature Comforts, I know we're all familiar with, being Georgia residents, see Terrapin, and I really enjoy these, I know, but I don't remember the exact profiles, the bodies, what pairs well with the specific recipe I'm using with this barbecue. Bar. And it means a lot to me. I take great pride in hosting and inviting my friends over. So I began to record things, um, creating a log. Started as a spreadsheet, later developed into a database. And what this does is it allows me to input these parameters of the food I'm making, the alcohol I want to include with this, the environment in which I'm hosting, the costs associated so I can set a proper budget, and my personal experience that I have with that. Can quantify that, rated from zero to ten stars. Ultimately, what this is going to get translated into is a mobile app for convenience that will allow us to come together in more of a social way. So that way, my friends like JT Lockwood, who presented earlier, can see what kind of beer I like. So when it comes down to whether it be my birthday or he's coming to my party, he knows what kind of six pack to bring. Associated with this is obviously some cost and revenue. Starting with revenue. Users on this app are going to have to pay a subscription just for consistent streams. This is going to be the lowest source of revenue. Alcohol manufacturers and other service industry or service industry businesses, restaurants, bars, clubs, will also have an opportunity to get advertisements and sponsorships through this, so that they can promote their own products. The real value with these companies is selling the user data on the back end so that way they can see what's popular among their own catalog and then they can enhance what they're selling, creating a mutual relationship between my up and coming business and their already existing and successful one. The cost of this is gonna start with about $100,000 because that's what it takes on average to get a successful app launched with this level of complexity. The projected three year maintenance cost is gonna be about $75,000 and that's just with everything from maintaining servers to uh, being innovative and growing the app further and including more data into this and expanding it. Uh, ultimately, I do have a few exit plans with this. This is not my end-all be-all. I would like this to get acquired so that way it can truly become something much bigger. The goal with this is to see it be out there in the world and to provide value for everybody else. The market I'm targeting with this is staying specifically in the United States. Internationally speaking, beer and wine are very popular. Beer and wine are still very popular in the United States, but this is starting on a much smaller scale. For the individual, I'm focusing on people who make $40,000 or more, because those are the kind of people that can afford to go and host events, go out more, and enjoy these kind of luxuries. End of the day, this is a luxury. That convert, that makes up for about 65% of the overall US population. This is targeting some casual drinkers. Uh, these are the people who are more so event hosts, party hosts, and things. This has actually been a uh, thing that I've seen and had the opportunity to participate in through a wine charcuterie night here in Delanaga, where I invited over about a dozen of my friends. We had different meats and cheeses there, and us being college students, not knowing anything about wine and having such a low palate, we really didn't know what tasted well. But everyone there had the opportunity to record what they liked and didn't like as a related to each meat and cheese. That went into a spreadsheet, getting translated to this database. They had a great time with it, and they said it actually proved valuable. Now, that same house is throwing another event later this semester, and beyond the wine, empty wine bottles that are stored on the top of the cabinet, we know what to kind of buy. So, in addition to these hosts, there's other people here in Dahlonega, one of, one of which is a friend of mine owning a cigar shop. He's expanding into getting into bourbons and whiskeys and things. He knows everything there is to know about cigars. As you might assume, a lot of avid cigar enjoyers enjoy bourbon and whiskey and beer with it sometimes. 
Um, I don't know if you gentlemen do at all. But this is going to provide him the opportunity to record an accurate um, pairing with certain tobacco products and certain alcohols. Uh, on a more serious note, there is wine and uh, bourbon enjoy or critics around the world, and especially in the United States as it relates to the South when it comes to bourbons and whiskeys. They'll be able to go on here, provide their input and expertise to create more user data that everyone can see and get uh, further ratings on. For the market, the key figures here is what's bolded on the bottom. So the top row highlights the amount that was sold in 2022 of these different categories between beer, wine, and liquor. The three-year growth projection of these markets is below, but my target is the event-based consumption, which compensates for 24% of the overall alcohol sales. These are the tenets of my like value that I'm trying to provide. Providing a personal list so that way you the individual can remember. Creating a social environment so you and your friends can connect on here and see what each other enjoy. And going above and beyond as a host. And that will lead to me providing gifts like I mentioned before, or being known as that person that can really pull everyone together and be that extrovert and provide even further value. So this is the drink index. Do you have any questions? So, um, so talk, talk a little bit about what I didn't quite get on the presentation here is how are you going to get these people to download this app on their phones? Is it, is it just a social parties? Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about how a company create awareness in the marketplace as it relates to the app and what are your thoughts on how you can get it out to right. build scale? Yeah, absolutely, sir. So, um, modeling myself after two direct competitors would be Untapped and uh, Vivio with beer, specific, beer and wine, respectively. Beer, uh, excuse me, Untapped went to local breweries and marketed themselves to build a mutual relationship with that uh, host, allowing them to put their menus online and for customers to go on and rate the beers, giving that data to the uh, respective brewery so that they can alter their menu and become more profitable in the long term. Uh, with this, I would like to go to restaurants here, even Delonica, knowing with my network here, knowing some of the restaurant and bar managers and owners, uh, I've interviewed them in the early stages of this idea, talking about how can I take your menu and what food you have, using, and use the feedback of customers to see what they enjoy drinking with that, and give that to you, and me in turn get a profit off of them. Uh, that your question, sir? Yeah, how do you plan on scaling that across the way? Is there channels you're going to go to, partner with, uh, groups that you're going to partner with, that you can sell that product to these restaurants uh, as a fixed community differentiated restaurant? That's interesting. Um, as far as making that individual restaurant unique or putting them in a more competitive advantage to what they have, I've not thought about that. Uh, I have thought about this. Yeah, she may have is, is go to companies like Cisco okay. that supplies food to the restaurants, and maybe there's a, a collaboration point there where you can you can start to talk with the restaurants that are buying from Cisco about this app that, that helps uh, helps the restaurant out and become more successful. Appreciate it. To add on to that, U.S. Foods and Cisco are helping to create menus for these restaurants. Right, they sit down there, they go buy on buy line items. You know, once a quarter or, or, or twice a week. Um, having me showing up and having a profile ready to go where I can click on a meal and see what those recommended lines are instead of asking the waitress or waiter, maybe it just started or, or that were known theory. I'd rather have that consistency. So I think, you know, that's something to definitely explore. Um, and don't be caught up too much with native uh, applications, right? Uh, you don't need to build a native iOS or native Android app. Those are kind of becoming the things of the past. Building a simple progressive web app will take that hundred thousand dollar startup you're talking about, and something like this can be built for, for fifteen to twenty grand, right? And all of a sudden, you're on websites, you're on mobile devices, you're you're on a you know every single device that's out there that can access a browser. So you want a low barrier of entry on here because it's going to take you a while to, to experience growth. You don't want to be out that money in the entire town. 
So what I'm just pulling is if you go that route, you can actually go to the direction of our website and have them embedded right into the website directly. So you know when people go today, if you can do our code to pull the menu, you can have them pull up right within that as well. Curious on the data. Do you plan to sell it? What are you thinking about doing? I'm selling it to try to profit on it. And here's why I asked. So years ago, when I used to work in the UK, Tesco rolled out an application that allowed you to order your groceries through an app. And they ended up selling it to an insurance company and they could see Chris Colson provides buy kit burritos. Well then my life insurance policy cost one hundred. So you have to be and if it turned out to be really bad for Tesco. So my, my guess my suggestion would be think about how you want to use that data because that's going to be your lifeblood. You want people to continually interact if they don't feel safe giving you that kinds of data. Like maybe I told my company I'm not a smoker, but I'm on there looking up cigars. You know, things like that, you gotta be careful with that. Appreciate I mean you have like never yeah, consider some indirect consequences like that. Yeah, or you could sell it to a insurance company saying, well, I'm not getting to you gotta do One other thing to look at is also control people, right? You're gonna have all of this user data, um, more than just their taste and preferences, but their demographics. So now all of a sudden when uh, the restaurant group or someone is trying to open up a brand new restaurant in Foresight or in Charity, all of a sudden you are now the sole source of point of, of contact of, hey, this is what the people are eating, this is what the people are drinking, this is what they're smoking. And you have all this information that a lot of these restaurants will pay 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars for on marketability studies that you can come in and undercut them and have all that information there for them. Do you see end users use this? Signing up for this thing, or is it mostly your, your customers being in restaurants here? I see more of the end user being the people in here. Because how this truly started was um, I did a poor job explaining it. Came back from training over the summer and truly hadn't thought about the things I liked at all in two months. Uh, and building that personal log is where this started. And beyond an iPhone, you know, note, big, oh, I like this beer and I like this wine, I need this thing. It doesn't truly record the experience you have with that. Uh, so the end user being the people, and then selling, or like I said, selling that data to a manufacturer. But I have not considered the end user actually being a manufacturer or some other company or a big restaurant like that. Yeah, I can see this being like a equal social app that can be used. Uh, you know, what comes to mind is a lot of nonprofits do fundraisers, which is a lot of drinking going on. Right, and, and you can come in and do a sponsorship, and they have a QR code, and, and it just creates some sort of a little fun thing that, that would have to be, be an opportunity for collecting a lot of data. And if you go social, look for local influencers. That's a good way to get that out really quick. They already have the audience. Any more questions from anybody else in the audience? John. So, uh, will the drink index take the place of wine scores and experts at breweries? And how is the drink index different than the competition like Googling the information or downloading smart? Yeah, absolutely. So, the goal of this is not to replace the job of somebody at a uh, winery like here in Delonia. I'm a big believer that human interaction is the most important thing, that it's always people first. Uh, and everything from like, okay. anyway, uh, this is meant to more complement that role and allow them to have an additional tool because all this is at the end of the day is a tool. As far as the competitors go, um, Vivio is the closest one to this exact idea because you can go on their, um, they have a website and an app you can use either and input the, uh, the restraints. So if you're having poultry and you want it to be spicy, so you need to have this kind of wine. But it's specifically just the wine. It doesn't talk about beers and liquors and things. And, um, the, the beer market is significantly greater than the one. And as far as Untapped goes, Untapped just allows you to give a rating and a review of a certain message that's specifically here. And it's um, it's nice because that relates specifically to that location. So it's a brewery or a restaurant in town, but it's only about beer and it's only a rating and review. It doesn't talk about whatever else you have. All right, let's give them a hand. All right, so we finished up all of the pitches. Uh, and so now comes the time when the judges kind of go away and they. Do 
figure out who's the winner, right? And who's in second? Runner up. Right? And uh, so we're going to let them find a spot. You guys want to find a spot? Oh, are you going to go in where the food is? Yeah. <laughs> no, so you better get your, if you want some food before they get in there, you better get it now. Okay. Let's stop. Let's stop. Before you talk to other businesses about your idea, think about filing a provisional patent. It costs like three hundred dollars, but it protects your idea, so somebody that you talk to can't take it and steal it. Good point. Now, all the rest of you, hold on a second. All the rest of you are going to have an assignment. Now, hold on. We're, we're, we're an active place here. We're going to get you engaged with a pencil. We're going back in time. <laughs> Typically, uh, we have a third place, which is the crowd favorite. And we usually have poll anywhere to. Uh, to collect those uh, votes uh, so that we can see who is the crowd favorite. Well, we're having some poll, uh, poll issues. And so we're going to go back to a little old-fashioned thing. And you guys are going to get to meet each other, run into each other, rather than sitting in separate places and everything else. Because we have sheets of paper up here with uh, a thing called a pen. You remember what that is? So, what we want you to do is to go up and do your crowd favorite votes uh, up at the table. All right, pardon? What is crowd favorite? No, you don't have to go Which name is it? The old fashioned way. Come on. Yeah. Well, we got to verify and then we got to make sure you talk to we think of it. Definitely, definitely, and um, back up. Yeah, yeah, let's get together. I want to get your next video. 